Sure. Let's we'll start. Melissa Perrinson with Techwalla and freelancer for many other publications. Good. Dan Bursky with a magazine called Chip Design. Okay. Good. Good. Steve Beale, I'm a freelancer. I write mostly for a magazine called How, graphic design magazine. Okay. Good. Uh, Cynthia McKelvey, I cover science for the Daily Dot. Okay. Very good. Linda Simon, I manage CAD and went in. Okay, for LinkedIn. Cool. David Wansley um, with New Center.io. Okay. David Gilder, freelance uh, Shutterstock and Baker. Okay, good. Takasu Masakazu from Fabcross Japanese Media. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. Organizer himself. Um, well, let me. Do, I'll just do a few opening remarks and and. Uh, and then just take questions, we'll go wherever you want, whatever you're interested in. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm never happy to answer the question, like, what's your favorite thing at Maker Faire? Because <laughs> partly I haven't even seen it yet. I think it's so much out there. But, uh, but uh, this is our 11th year in, in doing Maker Faire. Um, it, it started here uh, at the San Mateo Event Center. Um, we had maybe a fifth of the ground um, in our first year, had maybe uh, you know, 100 uh, plus makers and about 15,000 people or so. This year, um, um, we have over 1,300 maker exhibits or makers in there, and uh, um, we'll probably have over 150,000 people over two and a half days. This afternoon, we have 4,300 school children from Bay Area schools uh, bust here. Um, and I think actually LinkedIn helped uh, some of those buses. Mm. And uh, uh, so, we, you know, we, uh, and one of the reasons for doing that is we want, I uh, particularly want kids who may not uh, uh, have parents bringing them to Maker Faire to experience Maker Faire and see what this is all about. Uh, and so, uh, Maker Faire was my idea based on uh, having published Make Magazine and talking to lots of makers. And I thought, well, they're all, they're all really interesting people. I enjoy talking to them myself. I wondered if other people would share that interest. And, and I thought what the simplest thing, like a science fair, an art fair, is to be able to talk to people about what they're doing. And um, it doesn't seem that different. It's just you know put something out there and say what it is, why you do it, and be able to ask them questions. And those are, you know, that, that's sort of the core interaction I, I, I wanted to see. And what I think has impressed me is, um, especially just walking around today, is like, where's all this stuff come from? <laughs> you know, it's all stuff that people are already doing. Now, I don't like say, hey, I want more robots, or I want more 3D printers, or I want more crafting. It's just people come in and bring their their own um, their own things that they've been working on, and often in private. And Maker Faire gives them a place to share it with other people and connect to other people and talk about what they they do. Another thing we've seen over the years is uh, the development. Uh, sometimes those, those projects turn into products. Um, people come here with something that they made for themselves, and someone says, that's cool, can I buy it? And they, oh, I didn't think of that. And they go back and sometimes start a business or do crowdfunding. Um, you know, the number of makers uh, in, uh, uh, using Kickstarter, I mean, some of the days is really $25 million to raise Kickstarter by, by makers this year. Um, and, and so uh, there's a lot of ways for people to take an idea, develop a prototype, and then raise some money and be able to manufacture that thing. And it, it might be electronics, it might be just 3D printed, it might be a combination of things, but it's possible to do these things even as an amateur today. And that's, I think, what we see accelerating the maker movement. The second thing is this seems to map into something that's kind of old, which is hands-on learning and, and, and experiential education that uh, has been forgotten in our schools. And uh, it, we have a generation of kids that didn't get this. Um, and so I think that's the other. So innovation, makers as a source of innovation is one side, and then um, making as a, as a uh, really productive form of learning is um, kind of the other side that I, I think accounts for growth. So when Sherry, Huss, and I and others designed the Maker Faire, we wanted to be family friendly. We wanted kids here. We didn't want a geek convention or a, or a conference or a trade show. Um, we wanted families to come. We wanted kids to enjoy it. But we also wanted parents to enjoy it. And we weren't trying to like create a kid event. We were trying to create a family event. Uh, and we hoped that by just coming and seeing 
<coughs> ordinary people creating things that they would go home and say, that's something I'd like to do. And that what I think it's our cultural moment around this is people come to Maker Faire and they go, I'm a maker. I'm going to do something. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and rather than say, those people are makers, I'm not one of those. I like what they do. You know, it's like going to sporting events. So those are the professional athletes. They're really good. I'm, I do it. You know, what our, we see Maker Fair as a participatory event. And we really want to get people you know, learn, here learning to solder, doing things. But we hope it carries over beyond the event into things they end up doing in their own life. Okay? So I'm happy to give you more. Uh, uh, the other kind of step, we will have over 190 Maker Fairs mm -hmm. around the world. So, it's evolved from being a single maker fair to really being a global network of maker fairs. Um, we have four maker fairs with over 100,000 people. Mm. And that's uh, Shenzhen, China, mm. um, Bay Area, mm. New York, and Rome. And uh, we have maker fairs in major cities, uh, mm. Paris, Berlin, Istanbul, uh, Tokyo, uh, Singapore, mm. you know, on and on. Um, and, and, but we also have them in small towns. Um, in, in America, we have about 94 of uh, 190 fairs are in the U.S. And the others are split between Asia and Europe. Um, in, in about a month, the U.S. government will have a national week of making, celebrate making across the country. We'll have a national maker fair in, in, in uh, D.C. And uh, we'll have, they'll do other activities and things. So. Um, uh, but what's kind of cool is uh, next week or week from this weekend is uh, or two weeks is the European Union is doing a European Maker Week. And there's like I was talking to someone. There's 400 events associated with European Maker Week, and in October there's China Maker Week, hmm. and so it's really spread. And as you know, this is sort of this rebel army <laughs> kind of grassroots effort. And now we've got governments promoting it and agencies promoting it and uh, trying to figure that out. Someone was saying that, yeah. my guess is, you know, maker spaces, do you know what they are? Mm -hmm. Maker spaces are kind of workshops and community places. We're trying to get them into schools and libraries. We might have a thousand of them in the U.S. Someone was telling me yesterday there's, there's over 10,000 in China because every school has one. Mm -hmm. So we have 100,000 public schools in America. We need at least that many maker spaces. And um, we need them in other places. Um, you know, there's other 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 versions or forms of it. But I think it will. My goal is, is particularly with kids, is to get them to participate in creating that future, to give them tools and give them the, the mindset that allows them to create new things, solve problems that need to be solved, and per, you know, be actively engaged in that future, not just waiting for someone else to do it for them, or allowing or trusting others to be the drivers of that change. All right. Yes? Um, you, know, you, you, you forewarned us that you're not going to talk about your favorite stuff here. <laughs> but just um, maybe a roundabout way of sort of asking the same thing. Just you can tell a journalist did not don't <laughs> ask you a question. They just they sit there and noodle on how to ask that same question. <laughs> well, not really. So but either in terms of the fair this year yeah. or just the maker movement in yeah. general, what are the big trends that you see going on? Like what's oh, changed man. from last year, uh, yeah. if anything? Well, I, I, I mean, a, th a few things to pick out. I mean, the things, like we look, can look at this from a technology mindset, you know, and say, oh, there's some new tools and new things out there, um, new software even. And, you know, but uh, part of what stays kind of the same but does change a lot is some of the art and things that are here. Some of the, uh, you know, the dark room, I, I just wa was walking through and there's something called Cosmic Dance. That's a beautiful, it's kind of, a, it's these pieces levitating over a, a metal board and he calls it a fellow that did it, uh, calls himself a conceptual metal worker. Now, who would ever think there was a conceptual metal worker? But it's a beautiful spinning piece that or things are moving around. So that changes, right? That's part of this ch creative and cultural change that happens. Um, and that's a little hard to kind of figure out how to explain it. But um, laser cutters, uh, in, in the example, the Glowforge is something that um, they're here. Uh, they announced their product last um, uh, at the New York Maker Fair in, in, in 2015. And they have models I don't think they're shipping yet. but. Um, Laser cutters are kind of a pretty easy tool for crafters and makers to use. 
uh, and, and kind of use a 2D program to, to outline something, just letters, and have it cut out very easy. So you know, if you go to makerspaces, they're used quite a bit, but they've been pretty expensive, like $30,000. So they're making one under $3,000. And, and I think that, again, the democratization of technology here, where, where uh, microcontrollers, there's more, I mean, Arduino's kind of the, and Raspberry Pi are the two main ones here, but those are $35 price points, now there's some at five and six dollars. That means you kind of throw them away, you know, like put them into a project and so, you know, you need five. That was the kind of thing I was wondering about, yeah. like anything, like, like, like new price points for yeah. existing technology. Yeah, so we did a, our January issue of Make was on supercomputers. Hmm. In other words, they're super small but super powerful. And, and it really is amazing what you're able to do with that. Uh, they, um, uh, so, um, the whole world of like, what, what some people call the Internet of Things is really, uh, you know, these controllers, sensors, and, and they're just cheap. Um, so you can kind of experiment with them and try new things. Um, uh, and, and I think that's really fascinating. Uh, it means more people can do it. I like to think the maker movement is sort of this democratization of learning and democratization of technology. In other words, the tools of production. Are, are made available to more people, and it's easier to learn how to use them. Uh, you know, it's one thing to have like computers available to everybody. If we don't know how to use computers, then they're not very valuable to us. So that's that's kind of what I see here. Do you think that that is why now is ha, has been the time that was ripe for the maker movement to really gel? Because I mean, we've always had do-it-yourself kids. We've always had people who did things, who made things. But it's really only in this past decade yeah. that you've seen the concept of rallying around maker, being a yeah. maker, having access to some of these yeah. tools. Well, you, I, think, think? I think the tools uh, are a big piece of it. I, you know, my personal, when I started Make Magazine, was just seeing that, you know, I mean, personal computers grew out of the hobbyist movement as well, Wozniak mm -hmm. and other people. They, were, they wanted to build a computer. Just sort of go back to um, heat kits, and, and there was a whole group of people, that had kind of disappeared. Uh, and and I, I kind of had a thought that it might come back, um, <coughs> that those enthusiasts, um, like the early personal computer enthusiasts, they wanted to build and make things. Um, and, and I just had this idea, kind of connecting to them, that technology would be used <coughs> for hobbies, or, or for fun, you know, like, like you see uh, I, with drones here and, and stuff. So um, they're toys in, in ways as well as productivity tools. And, mm -hmm. and I kind of saw the world getting very serious about technology, IT this and enterprise that. And there's other area that's really fun and, and doing different things and, and people building things in their backyards. That's what I want to focus. But I think you're right in that this, this is a tradition really that's been around a long time. What kind of infused it now is sort of new technology started coming in. Um, and, and we don't see it as clearly, but it, it was things like um, the microcontrollers, 3D printers. You know, 3D printers existed but they existed at the industrial level for hundreds of thousand dollars. I mean, HP just announced a new hundred thousand dollar printer. That's not a hobbyist printer. But makers decided they wanted to build their own and they would figure out how to do that. So you have that movement of, of those things becoming available. But software is also a really important piece. Um, our CAD, uh, uh, CAD, you said a CAD person? So, um, you know, um, uh, and, and, if we can lower the barrier entry to designing 3D objects and creating things, either through scanning or other, um, there's libraries for downloading them. But if we could build more skills or, or make it easier for people to learn how to do that or make the tools easier. So software is largely, the, you know, both by networking us and providing interfaces to things, it's, it's kind of automating more of, of the expertise you need to make something, like, like take CNC machines, you know. Um, you could be a machinist and learn all of that um, to some degree. As it gets put, it, that expertise gets modeled in software. You're pressing buttons and setting up a job, and you're able to do it without knowing so much. Yeah. I just had a clarifying question. You said earlier that uh, uh, makers have raised $25 million collectively on Kickstarter. Do you mean makers associated with Maker Faire, or is that like in more general? Um, I think it. Um, you have to check. Julio uh, uh, Terra is here from Kickstarter. He quoted it today. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't I hear the whole clarification of it. Okay. Um, they'll, they'll probably come out with something, but I can follow up with you. And, and I think it's um, I think it's makers participating here, at least in the past it has been. Um, yes. 
So you mentioned uh, you know, focus on children and things like that. Is there an organized effort to put more maker spaces into the schools in the U.S., or is that something that's... It's, uh, what I call it self-organized, <laughs> meaning people decide to do this in So it's kind of, I always thought it's a sort of analogous to how did the school gardens get built. There wasn't a national program for that. I mean, Alice Waters had a lead model of gardens in Berkeley and, and other things, edible schoolyard. It's just people figure out something they want to do, and, and either the teachers or the parents or the students themselves, and they're, they're kind of building them themselves, you know, organically. So it's, uh, uh, there is no one way to do it, and I think that's a blessing. Uh, uh, they're learning from each other trying things and, and, and uh, so, you know one teacher in St. Louis told me he started with a closet and he allowed him to store materials and the next year he got a little bit of a room off of the closet and he said now I've got an $80,000 budget and I've got a real you know, program going but uh, sort of initiating things is kind of what I think the self-organized efforts do they get it going when you start it mm. people say oh do you need tools there's you know go on Craigslist or you know my friend you know, used to be a woodworker, has all these tools, we've been looking for a place to give them to, and, you know, it, it sort of grows is, that Is way. there a community or, or like a website community type of it? A little bit, yeah. 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 <coughs> I think what you find is that a lot of making is organized locally, um, which I think is a really good thing. Um, we just finished working on a project that we'll release in a month called uh, Maker Cities, and we're looking at sort of how maker, the maker movement is impacting cities and people in cities. Yes. yes. Uh, I think in the maker movement, it starts from the industry and technology, such as O'Reilly. But now we saw a lot of creative um, and uh, art people. Why the maker movement can expand in the uh, people's uh, how to creative and express themselves? Yeah. Mm. Well, I think the Maker Fair, in particular, is a platform for creative expression. Mm. You know, and I think, and, and and it doesn't have to be old form creativity, even the sense of like painting or, or things. It's, it's really whatever we define that to be. And it could be science as well as art. And mm. I'm really fascinated how these things um, intersect. And in, in, in simplest ways, it's like a robot that has a personality that mm. is expressive, is different than a robot that is just functionally doing something. And that's really what I, I like to see here. I, I think makers, it's kind of built into, it's kind of part of the, uh, like you create something and you want people to interact with it. It's sort of like a game. So. Um, you know, the more fun it is, or the more mm -hmm. uh, playful it is, people will play it. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, you know, makers can create something here, and they want someone to come up and say, that, that's cool, that's fun, mm -hmm. I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am? So makers, they think about themselves with the hobbies, right? And then they eventually become a product, and then become a service. Do you see more and more, they start with the interest, but they actually can make a living out of it? They become their career? Do you see a trend in yeah. this? Well, I think uh, you see a couple of things. One is uh, um, you know, young, particularly young kids. So sometimes it's like developing this capability, and, th and they may choose to go into engineering or design and sort of become professional makers in certain ways. Uh, uh, there's certainly a group of people that are pretty happy this, that this is just um, a side thing for them. Uh, they, they have a day job, and this is their thing they do, you know, for themselves. Um, but I think we see all, all, all of that. Uh, not everybody wants to progress that way. Uh, and what I mean by that is sometimes, so you're, by doing something, you end up meeting a lot of people. And those are really interesting people that you wouldn't have met if you didn't do that. And that's the reward. It isn't that you made a lot of money. There are people that want to start businesses, and they're using Kickstarter to, to fund it. And they hope to either have a um, you know a company that's that's uh, you know really successful, or s some of them maybe like you mentioned service. They may be people that know how to use three D printers, and there's a role for someone in the community to do that, and that's that's a service you know uh, that they provide to other people. Yes. So that's a question. Um, going back to the topic about the yeah, school and the makers, yeah. I, if I remember correctly. Well, we have school maker fairs, um, which we announced last year. We actually had a workshop today with 80 teachers in it on um, 
we think we, we, we start seeing it happen anyway and we um, we uh, wanted to kind of help to just promote that and so if you're getting if kids are making in school give them that's kind of like science fair but make a little bit more fun a little bit more open to creative things and so they uh, they end up <coughs> doing that and showing you know what they one of the ideas behind Maker Fair we call the greatest show and tell hmm. on earth. And we we think that, you know this sort of form of of, uh, of demonstration like show and tell is, is really important. It's not something that you just do in kindergarten. You should do it you know repeatedly and and, and uh, uh, sharing your work, getting recognized for your work, um, and it's kind of what we see in school. So this helps helps promote so that. So how is it going? Like a lot of like schools participate. Yeah, yeah. So we um, we'll have a, we'll have hundreds of schools do that this year. We also have a program called Maker Camp, which will run in starting in July. That is um, self-organized camps for kids, and we supply projects and, and a kit of parts for those uh, camps. Okay. Yes, question. Um, so out of the, I think you said about 190 Maker Fairs around the. Uh, 190 maker fairs around the world, yeah. and four that have over 100,000. Are those all associated with your mm -hmm. group? Do you yeah. have people trying to do them not in association? There are some, mm -hmm. but at this point, um, uh, and they're welcome to do that. Um, uh, we what, what sort of made this work is we wrote a playbook on how to do this fair. The, not this kind of side fair necessarily, but how to start one yourself. So a lot of this is getting out in the community, finding makers, bringing them together, inviting them to participate, and getting a venue, lots of logistics. Uh, and I think that's been real helpful. And increasingly, the makers, uh, we right now, <coughs> after today, there's a meeting with about 60 Maker Fair producers. Um, they come together and they learn from each other and talk to each other. So it, I think it really helps for them to be part of something. Yeah. Uh, um, but there, there's, there's a few places where they've done their own things. In China, there's a Maker Carnival. Mm. That, um, and a few things, but um, we kind of find uh, people people want to be associated with the whole maker yeah. movement um, thing, and, and be connected to what other people. What I think one of the interesting developments over last year, and I was visiting Singapore and Tokyo yeah. and Shenzhen. Mm -hmm. We're beginning to see makers traveling to all these different places to exhibit. Mm. You know, partly for fun, but also because there's a they want to be part of those fairs and even. Yes, uh, exactly. Shenzhen tends to attract people from Taiwan and, and other parts of Asia, and then it also attracts Americans wanting to kind of look at the factories and 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 uh, you know see the capabilities they have in Shenzhen for, for making things. Yes, I saw the over hundred people from Asia to here yeah. today already. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah, we have groups from from Asia, from Egypt. You know, I think we were actually Maker Fairs about a month ago. I was in uh, Cairo for our second Maker Fair Cairo, and, and really impressive. Not big like this, um, uh, you know, much smaller, but about 10,000 people was double from what was the previous year. Everybody's very young, I mean, the average age about 20. Uh, yeah. Very enthusiastic, and you know, it's kind of this point that they see an opportunity to do things. Uh, um, there's been a lot of turmoil there, a lot of instability politically and economically. But make the maker movement, you know, is something they can do. You know, and they can make a difference. Create something, share something. Is this the largest sorry, is this the largest Yes it is. Design? Yeah. And this architect wasn't here last year. Are they here this year? No, they not. Be here? They're not. Unfortunately, they're from Austin, Texas. Mm. Um, sometimes it just doesn't work out sync the sync up schedules and travel and things. They're real popular. Uh, their keyboardist is here with a LED piano in the dark room, uh, which I'll uh, admit that he made out of acrylic. And it's very nice. Okay. And the mousetrap, are they here? Mousetrap is here. Oh, they're here, okay. Yeah, they're in the south lot. Okay. Oh, uh, the, the other side of the question. Yeah. I think uh, we're still growing and expanding very fast, but uh, what do you think uh, we still a uh, big issue in the makeup movement? Or there some problem we make up with men? Well, I think it's still um, uh, it, it it's um, I, I think trying to get more uh, uh, 
broader participation of women, mm -hmm, broader mm -hmm. participation of minorities. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, um, I think those are still challenges mm -hmm. here, as it is in the tech world in general. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Did you ever think it would get this big? No. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> No, you know, like all you focus on is starting something, not like where it's going to go. Uh, can you do this? Um, and I, I, you know, really don't. You know, never, never, you know it's a it's a good way. You kind of wonder if, if you knew this, would you have done done it? But you know, when you see the impacts on people, like after about tenth year, you know, I, people come up to me and introduce them to a, 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 you know to one of their children who came here as an infant and now is you know ten ten or eleven years old and. Or someone else that is, you know, sort of what, came here, uh, you know, as nine and ten, and now they're in college. And this was something they've done every year as a family, and it, it has helped connect them. <coughs> a woman at the entrance said, "You know, thank you so much for doing this. this is, you know, this is so meaningful to kids that don't play sports. You know, they, they don't have that kind of interest in their life, and this is exciting and fun. It is, it is on that level of, you know, the kind of way we celebrate athletes." Mm. Yeah, you know, and I think that's that's at the core of this is celebrating what people do that they make, and regardless of their age. Thank you. Okay, folks, um, I'll hang around if you have any personal questions that you're too shy to ask me in front of the group. But uh, uh, please enjoy Maker Fair. Uh, the story is out there. It's about the makers. It's about what they do and where they come from and why they do it. And everybody has their own story. So. And, and you're from yeah, you're from Japan, Nikkei. Yes, but I just did. But based here, yeah. That's one of the better fairs, <laughs> Tokyo. Um, uh, uh, Japanese makers are very creative, fun, and it's one of my favorites. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.